all my life long I had panted for a draft from some clear spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfied my longing, through his life I now am saved. For was I and sought for riches, something that would satisfy. But the dust I gathered round me only mocked my soul sad cry. I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longing through his blood I now am saved. Feeding on the husks around me till my strength was almost gone. Long my soul for something better only still to hunger run. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longing through his blood I now am saved. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free. Untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found him, whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longing, through his blood I now am saved. great joy to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, go direct to the introduction of our speaker. Our speaker is from USA, of course. And by the grace of God, he's one of the ordinary panel. When I was ordained the ministry, I uh, see, I have the certificate here that I am the proof that yes, I was sir. <laughs> Or yes, this in the ministry that was in May 17, May of 1987. By the grace of God, uh, through their prayer, no? uh, we just continue to serve the Lord, serve in the Philippines for almost 15 years, went to Malaysia, but we are kicked out in Malaysia until God led us in uh, Cambodia. And when we were uh, kick out in uh, uh, Malaysia, we just ask uh, why, why, why? Until one day, a missionary said, Brother Kiros, if Malaysia is closed for the gospel, accept the Lord. Why don't you come to Cambodia and minister to the Vietnamese people? So I said, Lord, provide us for ticket. And in September 20 of 2001, we are on the airplane going to uh, Cambodia no? with only four plates, four glass, four pork, and four spoon, and for hundred dollars, we are here in Cambodia. God is good, amen? He just supply the burdens. So thank you for uh, praying for us. Many are praying for us all over the world, and the Filipinos also in the Philippines. Now, now today, <coughs> yeah. It's a great privilege after 27 years of uh, no <laughs> communication <laughs> with the ASCII family. And by the grace of God, last year we saw Madam Ruth Ann in the Facebook and I was so very happy. And then we met in Vietnam. Now uh, they are here in Cambodia. So let's welcome our pastor, uh, Dr. Jana Schmidt. Let's all rise up and respect for the man. Pastor, please. Sir, thank you. 
very pleased to be here. I'm very honored to be here. You may all sit. These recording devices are something the Apostle Paul didn't have to worry about. <laughs> All right. Well, we don't need to turn there, but I am going to talk for a moment about Acts chapter 2. I'm going to talk about it, and then we will turn to our main text. But in Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood in front of the people, they had all heard a great miracle. They are hearing the gospel preached in their own tongue. And so they ask questions because they want to understand how this happened. They don't recognize Peter's authority. They don't think he has any authority. They don't recognize anything of that sort. So he had to convince them from the word of God very good. Let's wait a moment. We have some very good guests coming in. Yes. Our friend, Philippine. Oh, very good. Very good. Wait just a moment. We're not to get the seat. It's so good that they're here. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're discussing now Acts chapter 2. We're not turning there. I'm just discussing it briefly before we go to my main text. But Peter had to convince these people that he is right. Today, if Peter talked to us, we'd say, oh, he is Peter. We know he is right. But these are people who didn't know Peter. They don't know he's right. So instead, he had to reason with them. He had to make them think. And so he quoted the 16th Psalm. In the 16th Psalm, the Lord says, his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So the question is, who is that psalm talking about? Is that psalm talking about David, who wrote the psalm? Or is it talking about the Messiah? And Peter said, let's be logical. David is dead. His grave is here with us to this day. Therefore, it cannot be David that it's talking about. It must be the Messiah. This is who it's talking about, the Christ. Okay? So, Peter taught us a rule. The rule is this. When we are reading the Psalms, and what is said in the Psalms cannot be about the author, it is impossible to be about the author, then we know it is talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? That is a very good rule. With that in mind, let's everyone turn to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. When Jesus Christ died, he actually died two deaths. He did not die one, he died two. Why? Because Adam died two deaths. Adam was told, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He ate, and he lived many days after that. But God said, You will die the very day that you eat it. So what? how did he die? He died spiritually. Okay, spiritually. 900 years later, he died physically. To die a physical death is not bad. To die the spiritual death is the worst thing that could ever happen to you. There is nothing worse. We know that everyone is born separated from God. We know that. It is a terrible thing. It has happened ever since the time of Adam. People have been born separated from God. That is why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must have another birth. Your first birth gave you physical life. Your second birth brings you back to God. So when Jesus died, if he is going to take man's place, he has to die two deaths. 
physical death. But he also said on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is a spiritual death. He became separate from God. In the Bible, the definition of death does not mean unconsciousness. It means separation. When you are separated from your body, you are dead. When your spirit goes away from your body, you are dead. When you are separated from God, you are spiritually dead. Okay? So in the Bible, death is always separation. So Jesus was separated from the Father on the cross. He was separated because he took our sins and he became those sins. Now, I know this. If I was the only person who ever lived and Jesus came to die for me, the moment that he got all of my sins and he was guilty of them, he would have cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because my sin is so terrible. My sins are so bad that if I was the only person, it still would have been agony for him to take my sins. A terrible thing. Every person here has memories of sin that make us so ashamed we don't even like to think about them. We would be ashamed if anyone else even knew about them. It hurts us to even think about them. Think of the day when your creator became guilty of that sin and he felt that guilt. He knew this is mine. The Bible says that he purchased, he redeemed our transgressions. He gave himself for our sins. That is the very worst trade that has ever been made. The most precious man who has ever lived is traded for the most terrible things that have ever happened. And it says he became sin. He didn't just hold them on himself, he became them. They are, they are now what he is. And this is why in Psalm 22, he says, I am a worm and no man. Why? Because in hell is where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. In Psalm 18, we are going to read about the spiritual resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died two deaths. Therefore, he will have two resurrections. Okay? And we will look at that. We'll start with verse 1. I know there is a sub, uh, there's a prefix there. To the, in fact, I'll read that quickly. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love the Lord, verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Now I will stop for a moment. So far, everything that is written could easily be David. Many times his enemies made him afraid. Many times. To say compassed means it is all around him. Okay? They're all around him. And it says he's become afraid. So this can easily be David. But let's read the next verse. Verse 6. Or verse 5. The sorrows of hell compassed me about, and the snares of death prevented me. When was David surrounded by hell? Okay? That never happened to David. When was he captured by the snares of death? Okay? That didn't happen. So if it wasn't David it's talking about, 
then this is Jesus Christ. Okay? And we will look at this psalm a little more and we will learn some things about Jesus Christ. Verse 6, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Verse 7, then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Now, when Jesus was on the cross, did the earth shake? No. I did. There was an earthquake. All right? There was a great earthquake, so the earth shook. But he answered, you know, I asked people for an answer. I'm glad that he's paying attention. Okay? That's a good thing. This is how he learns. All right? But there was a great earthquake when he was on the cross. Okay? And so the psalm says, God heard my voice and the earth shook. Okay? Says this in verse 8 there went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured, and coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. So it's talking about when Jesus was on the cross, God the Father became very angry, the earth shook, and then there was darkness. Was there darkness over the whole world when Jesus was on the cross? Yes, there was. This is a psalm speaking of the death of Jesus Christ. It's telling us about it. And we are learning some things that happened. One of the reasons everything became dark is men were not allowed to see what's happening. Okay? So for a moment, it all becomes dark. Can you imagine the next morning, the Roman soldiers, when they went to their wives and said, you must wash my clothing. I, I crucified a man. Would you wash the blood off? And their wife says, there is no blood. There is no blood. Can you imagine the, the, the whip that they whipped him with? And they're whipping his back. And then they go and say, oh, I must clean my whip. But there is no blood on this whip. Why? Because it is the blood of God. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. And God has taken it to heaven. Okay? It is there in heaven. It's in the basin in heaven. The very cross that he was upon, there was no blood on it the next day. Okay? Because it's the blood of God. It's the blood that will wash away our sins. It's the blood we're purchased with. So this is a different death than any other death that has ever been. So, it says this, verse 10. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed hailstones and coals of fire. Now, we we'll look at this for a moment. Let's think about Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible says, Cursed is he that hangeth upon a tree. We now know he is a cursed man. He is unclean because Roman soldiers have spit upon him. He is unclean because he has touched lepers. He is unclean because a woman with an issue of blood touched him. And not only that, he has taken... Every disease that he ever cured, the Bible says he bore our sicknesses. He bore our infirmities. He has taken them into himself. Why wasn't he unclean on this earth? Because the Bible says he was justified in the spirit. Okay? His spirit is keeping him clean. That's why the Apostle Paul says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul says, I was just a sinner. I was a terrible man. But then Jesus Christ gave me his spirit, and now the law cannot take me to hell. Okay? I am not unclean anymore. But what we see on the cross is Jesus gave his spirit back to the Father. And now there is nothing to keep him from being unclean. All the diseases that he had cured are now upon him. All the sins that he has forgiven are now his sins. All the things 
that have touched him to make him unclean have made him unclean. He has become sin. And it is a terrible thing. But also it has made the father angry. And the Bible says he cried unto God and the father heard his voice. Okay? He has cried unto him. Let me tell you something. Every sinner who has ever cried unto God has been heard. What God is looking for is the true cry of faith. That's what he's looking for. Some people cry unto Jesus Christ, but it is not a cry of faith. Okay? We discussed last night how that God will not despise a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Many people today have a broken heart. They have taken drugs. Their life is sad. Their heart is broken. They call to God. Many people are sad because they have committed sexual sin. Their heart is broken. They cry to God. But what they don't have is that contrite spirit. They are not humble inside. They are not meek inside. They, their pride is still there. And you must have both. You must have that broken heart and that contrite spirit. Part of the problem with soul winning today is the soul winner does not wait for the person to have the contrite heart. They just make them pray a prayer quickly and tell them now you are saved. And then that person is not saved. Okay? And that's a very sad thing. And then it is very difficult to get that person saved because they are what someone told me I am saved. Maybe I am saved. Maybe I'm not saved. I am not sure if I am saved. Mm -hmm. And this is a terrible condition to be in. I was in that condition for two years before I was saved. My wife was in that condition for 17 years before God was so merciful to her and showed her her sin and showed it to her. And it was so plain to her and she could come to him. So Jesus Christ on the cross, he has taken our guilt, what we are. He has taken it upon himself. And the father is angry and the father is going to do something about it. So we will look now at verse 13. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Now here we have a very strange verse, because it is talking about two persons, and each one is God. Okay? The Lord is Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because the New Testament tells us Jesus is the Lord. But wait a second. I have been telling you it is Jesus on the cross and he is crying. Then how is the Lord in heaven doing this? Because remember, Jesus gave his spirit back to the Father. Okay? So Jesus now has been ripped apart. He has been torn apart. When you study the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, you will find that a very poor man who could not bring a good sacrifice, he could go catch, he could get a turtle dove, a bird. Okay? I remember when we lived in the Philippines, Emmanuel used to catch birds and he would fly them like a kite. <laughs> and he would have a little string on them. He would fly the birds around, all right? And I, but I teach that because I tell people, oh, even a little Philippine child can catch a bird, you know, I would say. All right? So the thing is, they would have this bird, and they would bring the bird to the priest. Mm -hmm. And the priest would take the bird, and he nice. would do this, and wring the head off of that bird and tear it apart. Mm -hmm. What is that a picture of? Mm -hmm. It is a picture of the Godhead being torn apart at the cross. Mm -hmm. For all eternity, God the Father, the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost have had perfect love for each other. Mm -hmm. For all eternity, it has been holy, it has been perfect, it has been good. And now it is torn apart because one of them has become sin. Jesus did not want to become sin. He said, Father, take this cup from me. Take this cup. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. 
Now, there are some people who think that he was afraid of death, of the cross. I don't believe that. I have heard of very brave soldiers walking into death without fear. Okay? From many lands, they have done that. I don't think Jesus Christ was more afraid than those soldiers. What he was afraid of is bearing my sin. This is what he feared, to be so unclean. Okay? He was afraid of that moment when he would be separate from the Father. He is afraid of that second death. That is the most terrible death. And so when he gave his spirit back to the Father, then his soul was made an offering for sin. Okay? Now if you go back to the book of Leviticus, every offering for sin gets put in the fire. There are no exceptions. And that is why the psalmist said his soul was not left in hell. Okay, He was put in hell, but it was not left there. Why? Because he must fulfill the word of God. He must fulfill the law. And so what we are looking at here is the moment when the Father comes to rescue him from hell. Now let us think for a moment. The Bible is a, an extremely accurate scientific book. Okay. We know that the earth is round. Yes. One of the ways you could know that from your Bible is this. The Bible says that hell is a bottomless pit. Well, there is only one way that it, it could be a bottomless pit. Only one way. Okay? How could that be? The only way that could be is to have a round world and in the middle of that world is hell. So when I was a little boy, my sisters and I, we would go in the backyard and we would say, we will take shovels and we will dig a hole and we will go to China. <laughs> this is what we would say because we were little children. We would see a globe and we'd see that China is on the other side of the world. We'd think, oh, we will dig a hole and we will get there. We never got to China. All right. All we did is have our parents tell us you are very bad children. You have got holes in our yard, all right? But let's say that I had that ability. I could dig a hole. And I could go all the way through the earth. And maybe I'm looking on one side and Pastor Kiros is 8,000 miles away and then we're waving at each other in this big tunnel that I have done. And so I say, I will jump into this hole because I want to go to the other side. So I will go to the middle of the earth because that's where gravity will take me. I won't go up to that other side. Now when I'm in the middle of the earth, every way is up. No matter where I go, it is up. Okay? But the earth is turning. So if I'm in the middle of the earth, will I ever touch the bottom? No. It is a bottomless pit. Okay? So the Bible knew that long before man ever discovered it. Okay? You will find many truths in the Bible that men, it took them 2,000 years to discover. Let me give you an example of that. The Bible says that God wrappeth the light about him as a garment. Okay? Well, when I get up in the morning, I want to put clothing on. My wife says, you cannot go outside like that. You must put clothing on. Okay. So I take my shirt and I put it around me. Okay? Now what does that shirt do? It hides my body. Mm -hmm. People can't see it. Well, the Bible says that God does that with light. He wrappeth the light about him as a garment. Now when you are looking at me, what is happening, you're seeing the light bounce off of me and come back to you. That's how you see me. But what if the light did this? Would you see me? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. It would make me invisible. So your Bible understood that long before men ever understood the science of light and the science of sight. It understood that. So you'll find many things in your Bible that people thought, oh, these are just silly things. No, they're not silly. They're extremely scientifically accurate. So Jesus, when he became an offering for sin, that burnt offering, he is in the center of the earth. He is in that hell. But we know there are two compartments there. How do we know that? We know that from the book of Luke, when the rich man was in hell, and he could see across that gulf, and he could see 
Abraham and he saw Lazarus there. That's why in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says Jesus Christ went into the lower parts, plural, of the earth. He didn't just go into one, he went into both parts. Many people teach he only went into one. That's not right. He went into both parts. If he did not go into the flames of hell, then he did not get rid of my sins. Okay? That's where they're burning. That's where they're gone. Okay? So he went in there, and that's why he cries, I am a worm and no man. But let's discuss science again for a moment. We know that the waters of the earth work their way down into the earth and they begin to touch the hot rocks and that's why, for example, that's why there's volcanoes, that stuff comes out. That's also why there's geysers, hot water sometimes will shoot out of the earth because that goes down there. The more in South Africa, for example, they dig gold mines, some of the deepest in the entire world. And after a while, it becomes so hot that it's like being in an oven. You are so close to the center of the earth that it's like being in an oven. So then there are waters all around that. So hell is surrounded by waters all around. That's just geography tells us that. Our Bible tells us that. Okay. So let's watch this here. Verse 13 again. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. Verse 16, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. If you remember what Abraham told the rich man, he said, you are over there now. There is a gulf between us and no one can pass over that gulf. Well, no one could until Jesus Christ did. Okay? Jesus Christ was able to pass that gulf. The word Hebrew means the one who crossed over. Abraham was called the Hebrew because he crossed over the Euphrates River to be with those people. Paul said, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews because all the rest of you were born in Jerusalem. I crossed over the Mediterranean Sea to study with you. I am the Hebrew of the Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the true Hebrew. He has crossed that gulf. He has gone from hell and brought to paradise. Because it says in verse 16, he, took, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. That is the spiritual resurrection of Jesus Christ. When did it happen? It happened on the same day he was crucified. How do we know that? Because he told the thief, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. So, when Jesus Christ died, his soul has become sin. He goes into the flames of hell as a burnt offering, and he cries unto God. God heard him and is angry and comes down to the very foundations of the earth and brings him out of hell and brings him into that large place. That's really why Psalm 23 was written. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, he has done this in the presence of mine enemies. Can you imagine all the people in hell looking over at this man, Jesus Christ, who was delivered out of hell? In the very presence of his enemies, now he is comforted. Can you imagine for that thief on the cross, here comes Jesus, that man who promised he would be with me today, and he has come. That's why it says in the book of 1 Peter, he went and he preached unto those who were captives, those spirits, he preached to them. He told many of them, I am the lamb that was to come that you did not believe in. I am that lamb. And then he crossed over that gulf. Now let's go to Psalm 116. Thank you,
we will look at this psalm. Psalm 116, verse 1. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Now again, this cannot be David, because there was never a time in David's life when the pains of hell were on him. Okay? That never happened in David's life. Then it goes on and it says this. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. With thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Why were his feet falling? Because he was in the bottomless pit. He could never hit the bottom. That is one of the awful things about hell. But you know, if we were to list the things about hell that are very terrible. Oh, I think the devils would be very terrible. I remember as a child, I would lay in my room sometimes, and I would be so afraid that there are things in my room. And, you know, and my parents would tell me, oh, you were a naughty child, there is nothing in your room, you know, and, and but I would be afraid. And, and But imagine being in hell where there really are those things. And then the fire of hell. And it never goes out. And it is always there. And the thirst. Thirst is a terrible thing. It's an awful thing. When I was in uh, Pangasinan, Brother Kiros helped me to find three Filipino veterans of the Bataan Death March, Bataan Death March. And I talked to those three men, great heroes, wonderful men. And they all talked about the terrible thirst because the Japanese were so cruel. These men are marching. And they are weak from months of fighting without much food, and now they are marching and they are so thirsty they cannot even think they are so thirsty. Mm -hmm. One of them told me he saw a pump and he ran over to the pump and he pumped it quick. He didn't even care if a Japanese soldier shot him. And he put his hands down and he drank like this and he said a Japanese soldier kicked him, trying to kick his mouth, but his hands saved his life because his hands were there. But he got just enough water to make himself last to be able to get to the camp. Those were very great men. But thirst is a terrible thing. And that's why the rich man in hell, he is just thinking. And by the way, he, he makes prayers, but he does not pray for God. He prays for water. That is the way many people's lives are. Okay, All they do is pray to God for things, for things, for things. Okay? But they do not pray to God to know God, to have God, to have forgiveness. This is not their problem. All they want is things. They want things. Okay? And even the rich man in hell, he did not change. That's just how he still was. But the worst part about hell is that it never ends. There is never a time when it stops. If I put you in jail today and said you must be there 100 years, Oh, that would seem so terrible, but you would begin to count. You would wake up tomorrow, and you would say there are only 99 years left and 364 days, okay? After 10 years, you would say, ah, only 89 years, 364 days. You would count those days. And maybe you would say, oh, three years left. Two years left, two days left, and finally that day would come, and you could get out of this jail. But if you go to hell, there is never that day. It's over. The moment you go there, it is stopped. There is no more help. I fear for many people in the churches because some of them have what the Apostle Paul calls a vain faith. A faith that is not a true faith. It is not a faith that is secure in Christ Jesus. They have heard other people and they're copying these other people. They've even prayed a prayer, but it was not a prayer of faith. There was never any repentance. And so I always warn people in churches, 
what the Apostle Paul warned, examine yourselves. Examine. Whether or not ye be in the faith, you do examine yourself. You check yourself and make sure that I really have the faith of Jesus Christ. Yes. John Wesley was a preacher and a missionary before he ever got saved. And he ran across a group of people called Moravians. They were Anabaptists. And they told him, Mr. Wesley, if the spirit does not bear witness with your spirit, you do not have salvation. And he began to think about that very much. Mm -hmm. And he began to realize, he wrote in his diary and said, I have gone to the mission field to save the heathen, but who will save me? Okay? Who will come and help me from this? And finally, he went back to England where his home was. And he ran into another Moravian by the name of Peter Baylor was his name. And Peter Baylor talked to him about this thing of knowing for sure you are saved. And having this inward faith that God has given you, that you really belong to God. And John Wesley said, but I don't have that. And he said, should I stop preaching? And Peter Baylor told him, no, you preach faith until you have it. Then you preach faith because you have it. Okay? And so he went, he told his brother Charles about this new thing. That there is a way you can really know and you can for sure have the Spirit of God inside. His brother Charles scolded him and said, you are confusing me. You are a bad man to say this. Okay? And then Wesley got a, a letter in the mail and Charles says, I have found this faith. His first song was that my God should die for me. But thou my God should die for me. It's the first song that Charles Wesley wrote because now he has this faith. And then a few weeks later, John Wesley got that faith and he began to preach that faith. And that is the faith that we preach. Come ahead, sir. That's fine. We'll wait a moment for the visitor. I love that. I'm very glad that we have visitors. It's a very good thing. All right. Well, we'll go on a little bit more. We're going to look back here at Psalm 116 again. Ah, here we go. Very good. So back in Psalm 116, it says this in verse 9. And what we are about to look at is the faith of Jesus Christ. We are about to look at what Jesus Christ said when he was in the flames of hell, this is what he said. He said, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will do that. Okay? I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. People ask me, how sure are you that you are saved? Did I tell them? If I woke up tomorrow in hell, I would laugh. Because it is impossible for me to stay there. If I woke up tomorrow in hell, I would laugh and say, Ha, I cannot stay here. I have the faith of Jesus Christ. He has purchased me with His blood. I have the faith inside. If you took a basketball and you went to the ocean and said, I will hold this basketball down very low in the water. If you let it go, what will happen? Okay? If I was put in hell, I cannot stay there. Why? Because I have the faith of Jesus Christ. He has loved me. He has given himself for me. And the faith of Jesus Christ is verse 9. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. He said in verse 10, I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul quotes that very verse and says, we have that same spirit of faith. We have that. That is what he gives to a repentant sinner. Let me tell you something. 
when the worst person in the world sees their sin and they come to Jesus Christ and they are broken and they have no hope and they crawl to him for mercy, he reaches inside of himself and he gives them that faith. He gives them that. And now inside of them, it is like a light inside of them. And they now have a hope and they have a faith. And it changes them. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. He changes that person. It is impossible for a person to become saved and not change. Some people change on the outside. I could take Pastor Kiros' little dogs. And I could put a little hat on them. I could make a little shirt for them. Okay, Maybe I can teach them to walk on their hind legs. Okay, But they're still a dog. Okay, If we drop food on the floor, <laughs> they will eat it. All right? They're a dog. All right. Sometimes people come to church and they change on the outside. But they never change on the inside. Yes. Nothing has ever changed. The faith of Jesus Christ will change you on the inside. Amen. On the inside. And when the inside is changed, the outside will slowly change. It will slowly become something different. When we were little children, we would do an experiment in school where we would take some flowers and we would take water and we would put food coloring in the water, maybe blue or red. I think everyone has seen that. And you put the flower in there and slowly that flower changes its color. It's drinking that water with the food coloring. Well, you know what? When you begin to drink the waters of life, when out of your belly flows rivers of living water, that changes you. You cannot stay the same. And it is so sad to be in church and be one of those people who is not being changed because you have never repented. And sometimes people will look at you and, and think, oh, you are a good Christian. You will cry inside because you know you don't have that change. It has never happened to you. And what I'm telling you is that God will change you today. He will come to you. And all he is looking for is for you to take that mask off. Quit pretending what you are. Go to him and admit what you are. There has never been a sin so terrible that Jesus Christ cannot save it. Okay? There has never been a person so evil that Jesus Christ cannot save it. There has never been such a person. One of the people who signed that ordination certificate is William Randall. That was Pastor Randall's son. When he was 17 years old, he told his father, I don't want your rules anymore. And his father made him leave the house. And oh, his mother cried. Oh, my son. And he went out and he began to sell drugs and, and to do bad things on the streets. And he would carry a gun sometimes and be hanging with bad people. He worked in the same place where I worked. We would go to work together. And I would tell him, and I would tell him, William, there is a faith that you can have on the inside that is different than what you think you have. William thought that he had salvation, but he was just a bad person. And I told him, I said, William, I said, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. God isn't killing you. That is proof that you don't have salvation. That's proof you don't have it. You are living evil and he's not doing anything to you. And I told him, I said, many people pray a prayer when they're little, but they don't understand that prayer. And sometimes they need when they're older to finally understand and finally receive this great God and this Savior, Jesus Christ. When I told him that, he acted very angry. He told me later, he said, when you left, I went into the back room and I laid on the floor and I cried and I cried. And he said, I told the Lord, you must show me what the truth is. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it was about six months later, he came into the house of God. And he was listening to the preaching. And he got up and he told his brother, he said, I am going to go home today. Mm -hmm. And I am not going to stop praying until I have found this great God that my father preaches. Mm -hmm. I will not stop until I have found him. And that night he came back into the house of God and he had found the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay? Hallelujah, I have found him who my soul so long had craved. Jesus satisfies my longing. Through his blood I now am saved. There is not a person here that he will not do that for. Now 
And we will wrap this up quickly. Verse 10 again. I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loose my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of the O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. What God wants from you. He is not looking for you to live a better life. You probably don't have that ability. Probably because you are here, you're already proving you are trying to live a better life. Okay? What he wants to do is come and give you a better life. He wants to forgive the old life inside of you. He wants to get rid of that old life and replace it with the life of Jesus Christ. And then you will come into the house of God with thanksgiving. Pastor Kiros.